Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest has come from all the way across the pond in the United Kingdom. He is the member of Parliament from Wickham. He's a member of the House of Commons uh, Select, Treasury Select Committee, and he led the historic first House of Commons debate on the institution of money since Peel in 1844. Let's give a big old USA welcome to Steve Baker. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a really huge privilege to be here with you today for two reasons. First, because we've had some amazing contributions, with which I've overwhelmingly agreed, some inspiring contributions. And I particularly want to pay tribute to the young people we've just heard from. I'd just like Julie to say that Julie's said some amazing things today about the Occupy movement. I, too, have been along and spoken to the Occupy movement, and they get it. And we should not be afraid to make common cause with our opponents where we can. It takes great courage. And I just want to pay tribute to Julie for saying before you all that we should go and make common cause with the Occupy movement, even the Occupy movement, if we can. So Julie, well done. Congratulations on your courage. But it's also a great privilege to be here with like-minded, moderate conservatives who, with me, want to end the Fed. Now, we are in good company. It's a little-known fact that uh, Walter Badgett concluded the book Lombard Street by explaining that he had tediously insisted that every bank should keep its reserve, and that, in fact, what he was doing was explaining how to cope with central banks, not endorsing them. So Walter Badgett thought that central banks were a counterproductive institution. Milton Friedman said they should be abolished, and even Alan Greenspan, many of you will know, once endorsed gold and free banking. So here is the irony. We are trapped in a situation where even some of the most famous names in central banking and monetary policy think that central banks are a counterproductive institution. Now, what Lady Thatcher should really have gone on to say is that governments have always had a third way of funding what they want to do, and that is debasing the currency. They can either seize your property today Borrow, it against a borrow against a promise to seize your property in future, or they can seize your property by stealth through debasing the currency. So I want to begin my substance of my remarks by saying that the answer to this question is the central banks are the problem. They are the cause of our difficulties, they are the cause of the enduring problems we have in our economy, and they will not be the answer. The world is in the grip of a determined experiment in two things. One is credit expansion, and the other is the deliberate manipulation of economic expectations. In other words, it's monetary socialism. If this was done, this system of co co cooperating international com committees, deliberately planning the supply of a commodity, if this was done in any other area of human cooperation in our lives, it would be spotted immediately as socialism. This monetary socialism is all the more dangerous because it is dressed up in the language of the free market, and that is why we, as conservatives, must oppose it. It will have profound economic, social, and political consequences. Now, you might ask, if you've looked at my biography, why is an aerospace and software engineer standing on this platform saying, end the Fed? Well, it's because my life was twice interrupted by the errors of central bankers, by fiat money and central banking. I left the Royal Air Force to get involved with software during the dot-com boom, which promptly ended. Somebody showed me Mises' causes of the economic crisis and Hayek's and monetary theory in the trade cycle. I thought nothing of it. I thought, well, it can't be true. If it was true, the politicians and the economists would change the banking system, change the system of money, <laughs> and we would solve this problem. I then went on as a software engineer to work with, their bank, with banks and their regulators, and one of the things I realized as a software engineer, asking the detailed questions, how does this system work, is that they didn't really understand how the system worked or what the implications of it were, even to the point that a senior FDIC employee, a senior FDIC employee, told me to get lost when I told him that banks loaned money into existence. It is a ridiculous position that we've got into, and one of the two reasons that I got into politics was to change this absurd situation that central banks and fiat money, government policy, which is supposed to save us, is in fact putting us into ever greater trouble. I want to just briefly say why I think this issue is just so important, what uh, might be done, how we might proceed, and what if we fail, if I can possibly do that in the time. 
We know from human history now that the only plausible organisation of society is one based not only on the private ownership of the means of production, but on private risk-bearing and private control of the means of production, in other words, ending moral hazard, but also on prices, profit and loss, so that entrepreneurs can guide their actions into better serving other people. In other words, the free market is a system of service to other people. And now that is something that our opponents need to learn from us, that you are serving somebody else when you make a just profit in a free market. But it is the only plausible system of society. It means that money is an indispensable instrument of human society, and it means that if there is something wrong with money, it will be pervasive through all human cooperation. Now, if we look at a slide that uh, I think you have seen already with Larry earlier, since the end of the Bretton Woods monetary system, we have lived in a categorically different monetary environment. The chart on the right is the one Larry used. It's a log scale uh, of uh, the composite price index in the UK back to 1750. And what you can see is that prior to the, 20, uh, the 20th century and war, we basically had a system in which productivity brought prices down. Then post-1971, the value of money collapses. As it happens, I was born in 1971. It was, of course, the year that Bretton Woods ended. I quite like the chart on the left, which is on a linear scale, because it shows you just how catastrophic and categorically different the monetary environment has been in our lifetimes. Now, what have economists said about such a thing? Well, it turns out occasionally Keynes and Mises agreed with one another. I won't read the whole thing. But he mistakenly, Keynes mistakenly attributed this sentiment to Lenin. But he, Lenin is said to have declared that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. Lenin was certainly right. There's no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction, etc. He talks about the equity of the wealth distribution. Mises, in his famous book on socialism, which converted Hayek to be a liberal, classical liberal, wrote about inflation. Now, he catalogued a number of other ways in which socialists undermine capitalism, but he said this, inflation is the last word in destructionism, but increases in the quantity of money and fiduciary media will not enrich the world or build up what destructionism has torn down. Expansion of credit does not lead to a boom. It does lead to a boom at first, it's true. But sooner or later, this boom is bound to crash and bring about a new uh, depression. And he talks here again, as you can see, of the fact that politicians end up hopelessly unable to deal with the circumstances that have been created other than by creating more money. If anybody's in doubt, let's... Uh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, I hadn't shown you the Mises quote. Many of you will be familiar with it. If anybody's in any doubt about what's happened to money, well, this is the quantity of M4 outstanding in the UK. There it is from 82 to 2014. The money supply in the UK tripled under new labour from about £700 billion in 1997 to £2.2 trillion in 2010 before stagnating even with QE. Is it any wonder the economy is working differently now? If you triple the money supply in an economy over 13 years, is it any wonder that the people nearest that source of new money get richer? So are we surprised that in the UK the economy is overwhelmingly distorted towards the banking system, the housing sector, and to London and the South East, where the financial system is based, whereas people further away in Scotland and elsewhere struggle. So look at house prices over a similar uh, uh, time scale. What you find is a massive boom in house prices, and if you are able to see the detail, you find that it reflects the geographical distribution, how far you are from the source of the new money. In fact, I won't take you there. So the crux of the matter is this, that for 44 years, the monetary policy establishment has stored up problems through chronic inflation and then looked the other way by defining inflation as something which ignores the bubbles that they're creating. That has undermined not only the market economy, but faith in the market economy, and that was entirely predictable because both Keynes and Mises agreed upon it. We're now in the midst of this determined effort to restart credit expansion and a determined effort through new powers to central banks to use economic expectations and regulations to cope with it. Now, we will have, if the Austrian school is right, a worse crisis later. Now, I don't wish to be hysterical, so I will leave it to somebody who notoriously worked 
for Gordon Brown in the last government, and that was Damien McBride. And he put out, during the recent period of market turbulence, he put out three tweets. He said, advice on the looming crash number one, get hard cash in a safe place now. Don't assume banks and uh, cash points will be open or bank cards will work. Number two, do you have enough boiled water, tinned goods and other essentials at home to live a month indoors? If not, get shopping. And thirdly, crash advice number three, agree, agree a rally point. What have I done? Spoiled my presentation. Agree a rally point with your loved ones in case transport and communication gets cut off somewhere you can all head to. Now, I don't wish to be hysterical, and so I'm glad to leave it to Damien McBride. But this, then, is the fundamental problem that we have. Kevin Dowd, my friend, a friend of many of you here, has predicted the collapse of the dollar. Detlev Schlichter, an Austrian school economist and practitioner, wrote a book which I endorsed called Paper Money Collapse. We've ended up tolerating a system which is chronically inflationary because it funds the deficit spending of the welfare state. That was the subject of Alan Greenspan's great essay, Gold and Economic Freedom. That is why we've tolerated it. What it means is that we're not just in a crisis of money, we're in a crisis of political economy. We're in a trap now where raising interest rates might well produce systematic bankruptcies, crash the financial system, and leave us back probably in a worse place than we were in 2008. And yet, if the Austrians are right about how cheap credit distorts the structure of the economy, leaving us in this position with cheap credit at this rate will only make the crash worse when it comes. Now, George Osborne, to his credit, is balancing the budget in the UK. It is a good, sound, solid, conservative thing to do. And it is absolutely vital. Because without uh, balanced budgets, we cannot have sound money. Without sound money, we cannot have a stable, sustainable, and just social system. Um, some of these symptoms are felt by constituents in Wickham. This is why I feel able to talk like this about this subject. One lady thanked me for leading a debate on money creation and society. She said, why is my house valued higher than it's worth? Why do crashes keep happening? Who owns the money supply? Why haven't I had a cost of living pay rise for seven years? And yet the CEO just bought a Pacific Islands. These are the issues of the day, and we must listen to our opponents in order to make sure that we make common cause where we can, show them where they're wrong, and persuade those who are undecided to settle on our side. Because here is the problem. Today we live in a time, whether you look at Greece or Spain or the United Kingdom with Jeremy Corbyn or indeed in the United States with Donald Trump, where easy answers, easy answers and the use of power are popular because they are easy understood, easily understood. We need a paradigm shift in the economics of central bankers. They need to start thinking about production time, the fact it takes time to raise cattle and crops and it matters what the interest rate is during that period. We need to stop them acting as big players in the economy and deranging the capital markets. All of this means profound change. It means trying to change the system that we have. It means getting politicians out of the way so that Bitcoin and new innovations in gold can come in and make sure that people have a choice. Now, this is a difficult task that lies before us, but we should pick it up with buoyancy and hope because we know the principles which will get us through this, because they were once called liberal in England. They're often called conservative. They might well be called American principles, but above all, they rely on a concept without which there can be no prosperity, no virtue, a concept which all of us depend on for our prosperity and for our happiness. It is the concept of liberty under the law, and it is time to apply that concept to money and banking. Thank you very much. <laughs>